good evening uh, participants uh, today we have with us a very young budding scholar dr ketki uh, dr ketki presently is a post doctoral fellow at the manipal center of humanities and uh, she, she researches and teaches uh, single studies and gender studies she has a phd in women studies from uh, this tata institute of social sciences mumbai her doctoral area focused on uh, sexuality education and adolescent masculinities in the middle class uh, mumbai her uh, writing has appeared in very uh, prestigious uh, you know journals and magazines such as uh, medical ethics journal of porn studies uh, new york times in plain speak teachers plus dna kafila online round table india and ultraviolet and uh, ketki also has an uh, to add to her phd degree she also has an mphil in cultural studies from flu hyderabad and uh, she has an ma from pondicherry university so ketki on behalf of team dad voyage on behalf of uh, myself and uh, dr hari om singh it's an absolute honor and pleasure to have you today so we are thoroughly looking forward for a cerebral treat today on the biology body and culture uh, over to you ketki Thank you so much, Dr. Sekhar and Dr. Hari Om. Thank you so much for having me here, for giving me the opportunity to present this, to be able to reach out to a far wider audience, a different kind of audience, and I welcome uh, welcome everyone here. Okay, so let me start. So today I'm going to speak about biology, the body, and culture, and uh, here is the overview. Uh, can you all see the whole overview? Yes, yes, yes. Oh, you can see my whole screen, right? Yes, yes, yeah, absolutely. So, just in case at any point of time you cannot hear me, or if my voice cuts, maybe you can tell it to Shaikha, then he can tell me. Is that all? Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll let you know. I'll let you. Know. I'll right. be there. I'll be there throughout. All right. Thank you so much. Okay. So we're gonna uh, just just to give you an overview. I'm gonna start with discussing biology and culture, and in that we're gonna deal deal with with the words of semiotic and symbolic, and we're gonna talk about Body as this goes, and then after that we'll go on and discuss Butler's idea of performativity. And the main, a large chunk of today's lecture will be around sexual politics, sexual politics, and we'll see how that travels from from the U.S. to India, and we'll wrap up with um, a small discussion on posthumous. Right, so it will give you a certain thread, a certain thread of you know how these things and how these ideas have you know ideas from body culture and all of that has developed, right? Nature, body, biology. Okay, so now we start with uh, the body and um, culture, right? So we have this. Um, yeah. So whatever I'm going to say right now is taken from a number of texts, a number of books, and don't worry about that. The last slide will give you a reference. The last slide will give you a reference of the of the of the text that I'm using. So for instance, here for this slide, I'm using Mary John's text, which will be there. The reference will be at the end, right? So now, especially in the West, and we're not talking about India at the moment. So in the West, there is this kind of divide, right? When we talk about gender, when we talk about biology and the body and sexuality, there is this nature culture divide, right? So if you can say nature, you no know, biology culture, right? This nature culture divide, where nature comes to stand for what? For women, for fertility, for the earth, for biology, for the body, right? And then you have culture, which is the domain of you know masculinity of men and so on, right? So you have this. That nature culture divide has been something has been a debate which a lot of especially from what Mary John says a lot of Western feminists are still grappling with right and in the Indian context is different we're not going to discuss that so if you want to look at how that is different you can have a look at that uh, when we get to the reference section okay so now you have this nature culture divide and we, we start with Freud saying that. Biology is destiny. The fact that biology is destiny means that whatever your biology is, whichever body you are born in, that is your destiny. If you're born as a woman, you will be that. If you're born as a man, you will be only that, right? So the biology is destiny, right? So you have this idea that your destiny is predetermined by the fact by the fact of your body, of the biology, right? So that comes from that. So you have Freud, 
and then suddenly not suddenly well you do have this shift that french feminist uh, simon de beauvoir makes now simon de beauvoir makes this big shift from biology destiny that you now you instead of saying that now your destiny is predetermined right so when freud says biology destiny means your destiny is predetermined by your biology by your nature there's nothing much you can do about it or beauvoir says is no hello there's a shift right she's saying is that one is not born a woman there is nothing inherent in your body you are not born a woman one becomes a woman right so there is that shift from saying that whatever you are born in that is your destiny so saying no you are not born that way you become a woman right so there is that shift between your gender instead of it being fixed your gender becomes constructed right so we say that the gender is constructed by socio cultural context right so you become a woman you might be born you are not born a woman and born that way but you become one right so that was a major major shift in how we understood gender how we understood biology how we understood the body that major shift right now similarly since i said we'll talk about julia christeva's um semiotic and symbolic so julia christeva when she talks about semiotic and symbolic she talks about it in terms of a theory of language right and what she is saying is that semiotic and symbolic are connected you know and here very often like many scholars give the example of game of game joy julia right so what is the symbolic and uh, semiotic right symbolic the kind of writing comes from body energy from the subject drives an articulation from the nature from feeling from the unconscious from the body so again when we talk about sim- semiotic and symbolic we have this distinction where the semiotic is coming from that unconscious from the bodily energy and you have the symbolic which is you know far more ordered clear orderly meaning you have language you have grammar you have culture you have reason your consciousness so again you have this divide nature and culture feeling and reason masculine feminine unconscious conscious the body and the mind right so we have this again and what we are just about saying is there are certain kinds of writing so in, in the context of ulysses we see that let's say molly has um, certain passages where you know she's talking in stream of consciousness so that would be something which is coming from the subject drives and articulations this body energy something which is not so called coherent right but she's saying is that and then the symbolic is when we talk you know rational scientific kind of writing you know where it's coherent and all so what she's saying is julia was christopher saying is we could understand this as this divide but she's saying no the semiotic and symbolic this language thing these are connected so in any text because here we are talking about the theory of language so she's saying is in any text if you see these are interwoven and connected it is not also separate right but this is just to connect to you with this idea of nature culture right and then we shift to the idea of that gender is constructed that you become a woman you are not just born a woman you become a woman right so i hope that shift so today it seems to us fairly obvious right that gender is constructed but that idea itself is fairly new in the sense that for the longest time we had this idea that biology is a destiny right and this is a very major shift and that's one of the reasons why I'm emphasizing on it right it's it's a f- very very major shift right okay now so one is you have biology as destiny then second you have is one is not born a woman gender is constructed now we come to the third position right we come to the third position which is judith butler now what does judith butler say judith butler is now a completely bewildering kind of a and also very fascinating and very very important understanding now what she is saying is that so let me just go back so that you don't get confused okay so now what butler is so now when we think of gender is constructed right the way the mondo bovar says this okay we have this idea that sex and the body right the body the biology that is fixed and that is given and what is constructed is gender right so your body your female body that is fixed your femininity is constructed right your gender is constructed right 
now what butler is saying is so that means that there is a difference between gender and sex right that your sex is pre given right that your sex your body right that biology that you have your sex male is pre given and masculinity is constructed right so that means there is a difference between sex and gender right that sex is pre given and that gender is constructed right and that is also something which which bohuar and all these people are functioning with right that gender is constructed sex is established from the beginning right now what butler is saying is so if we think that sex is given and gender is constructed there is a difference between sex and gender now what butler is saying is this is the third position now what butler is saying is that is difference this difference between sex and gender is not a difference at all how she saying is both sex and gender are constructed so earlier we always thought this sex is uh, fixed and gender is constructed now she saying that difference of one being constructed one being fixed is not there at all because both are constructed which basically means that there is no given there is no given of fixed sex or body on which you are constructing gender right so let me reiterate because this is a very interesting and complex idea right that she saying is there is a, that the difference we think of sex and gender sex being given and sex being fixed and gender being constructed that difference is not there because sex is also constructed gender is also constructed how so gender being constructed we have understood it right how is sex constructed let me explain so this these ideas judith butler gives in her book gender trouble so that's again there in the reference you can go to the when once i show you that slide you can note that down and have a look at the book gender trouble and let me give you a uh, little warning it is not a very easy book to read but it's worth it okay so now what judith butler says is how do how i mean how does she arrive at this thing that sex is not constructed that sex is also constructed right so she saying is if you have any given sex right she saying there is no given sex if you have any given sex right it is you know sorry we think of it as natural right that sex is natural it is anatomical right there is anatomy there are chromosomes there are hormones right so any body it is not right we think of it as anatomy as chromosomes as hormones as also on and so forth right now she saying is this body this sex that we see what establishes the fact that this is this she saying is how do we know how do we know that this is chromosome how do we know that this body is this she saying is that the facts of sex are also discussed how do we know that we know through we know but we know it through medical science we know it through scientific discourse so what she saying is the facts what we think of as facts as given of the body right as in the anatomy is given right the chromosomes and my hand and my face all of it my body is given right she saying is how do we know that this is given how is that idea coming to us then that idea is coming to us through science it's coming to us through scientific discourse it is coming to us through medical discourse right so what she is saying is these are mediated again through discourse right so what she is saying is these even the fact of the body even the fact of this sex of this chromosomes right because sex when you speak you speak of this x x and x y chromosome right and hormones right So even these chromosomes and hormones, how do we know what they are? We know what they are because of science, because of medical discourse, right? So if it is because of discourse, how is it given? It is coming to us through discourse, right? Which basically means that even sex is discursive, right? So earlier we thought that only gender is discursive. She is saying that sex is also discursive. which basically means that there is nothing meaningful outside discourse this is a foucauldian perspective now i am sure many of you know what discourse is but just in case there is somebody who is not clear they might be lost so i'll just quickly explain that now what foucault says is that anything that we know 
is within our discourse as in is within our discourse so for instance if we know something about the body it is within the medical discourse it, it is within books it is within that right and when he says that nothing is outside discourse he doesn't mean that the body doesn't exist or matter doesn't exist what he means is that it acquires meaning the body and sex or anything anything that we discuss for the matter acquires meaning only through a particular discourse right if not this discourse there is some other discourse so in that sense everything is within some discourse so using that idea what butler is saying is even the fact of sex even the fact of chromosomes and hormones are coming to us through the medical discourse through the scientific discourse so even sex doesn't exist before that discourse so sex is not pre-discursive that sex there is no pre-discursive sex sex is also constructed right those hormones what we think of x x x y those are also coming to us through science right so any fact it's coming to us through a particular discourse scientific discourse artistic discourse medical discourse literary discourse is coming to us so in that sense even the sex is not pre-discursive so that means that it is not given so it's not that the sex is given and then we have the discourse and we have gender around it even sex is discursive and constructed so is gender okay um so for those who might find this a little difficult to grapple with uh maybe you can go back and read the uh, uh, judith butler's gender trouble or you can look at Foucault's ideas of discourse that might help you but let me reiterate again that now the, that difference between sex and gender is no difference at all because both are constructed okay which basically means she's saying is that's where now we go to her theory of performativity right what she's saying is that we then there is no there is no original right we have this idea that there is some original kind of gender there is some original kind of sex and then on that you construct she's saying is that even the gender that we have has no origin and it's not like there is some original idea of the woman of femininity that we are imitating right there is no original of it there is no essential gen gender and she's saying is gender is performative now what does that mean and i'll also show you a video right what she says is that that gender is a doing right it is a doing it is a deed right that there is no doer that's a doer it's not that before the doing there is a doer and the doer does the deed no she's saying is how does the doer come into being the doer comes into being through the doing it is not so again that idea that you have pre discursive sex and on that on that pre given foundation you are building gender similarly gender performative means that there is no already pre given doer that doer comes into being every single time there is a doing there is a performativity every time it is reiterated it is something that you do again and again and again right i'll be clear so now gender is a doing right it is a deed so the gender comes into being every time the doing happens there is no gender prior to the doing so there is no gender prior to doing that right you are every it comes into being every time you are doing it so every time it changes right so so this idea and and we'll understand why this idea is important is what she's trying to say is there is no that foundation or base right there is no foundation of base of sex similarly there is no foundation of base here of gender also right there is not that you are already established that is established every time every time it is made a new right every time the gender is made a new by doing and there is no essential doer the doer is also every time made a new through the doing now let us watch judith butler herself talk about it um choika just in case you can't hear my computer audio just tell me yeah i'll let you know 
can't hear the computer audio, right? Okay. No, no, no. Okay, so let me stop sharing the screen and I think I'll have to switch on the audio in the when I share the screen. We roll. We're act performative is a little different because for something to be performative, we act and walk and speak and talk in ways that mm, consolidate an impression of being a man or being a woman. You know, I was walking down the street in Berkeley when I first arrived several years ago, and a young woman who was, I think, in high school leaned out of her window and she yelled, are you a lesbian? And, and she was looking to harass me. Or maybe she was just freaked out or she thought I looked like I probably was one and wanted to know. But instead I just turned around and I said, yes, I am. And that really shocked her. We act as if that being of a man or that being of a woman is actually an internal reality or something that's simply true about us, a fact about us. Actually, it's a phenomenon that's being produced all the time and reproduced all the time. So to say gender is performative is to say that nobody really is a gender from the start. I know it's controversial, but that's my claim. Think about how difficult it is for sissy boys or how difficult it is for tomboys <laughs> to function socially without being bullied or without being teased or without sometimes suffering threats of violence um, or without their parents intervening to say maybe you need a psychiatrist or why can't you be normal. So, you know, there are institutional powers like psychiatric normalization and there are mm, informal kinds of practices like bullying which try to keep us in our gendered place. There's a real question for me about how such gender norms get established and policed and what the best way is to disrupt them and to overcome the police function. It's my view that um, gender is a is, is culturally formed, but it's also a domain of agency or freedom. It's most important to resist the violence that is imposed by ideal gender norms, especially against those who are gender different, who are non-conforming non in, their, in their gender presentation. <laughs> Yeah, so now you've heard Butler herself say that, this un, uh, explain how it's performed every time anew, right? It's made anew. Now, what happens when, um, this is something which she addresses, which a number of people also ask her. Now, if you want to have a politics based on this kind of subject, which is so unstable, which is changing every little time, right? So how do you have that, right? So that's what she addresses in her um, article, Contingent Foundations. What she's saying is that the foundations of any politics need to be contingent. They have to be subject to change. And she doesn't see that as a loss of politics. She doesn't see that as a way of losing your, that identity of losing the way you, you know, uh, mount a politics on a particular subject, right? So she's saying is that that let's say that if you know what is the subject of let's say feminism, right? So she's saying is there is no subject of feminism. That subject is made anew every single time, right? So the foundations on which you build any politics, right? Those foundations are always subject to change, right? Those foundations are contingent. Contingent is subject to change, right? So those are made anew every time, right? So that's why you it's very important to understand now this shift from nature, culture, biology as destiny to gender being constructed, one is not born, but one is becomes a woman to that be it sex or be it gender, all of it is constructed, all of it is uh, there's nothing which is pre-discursive and at the same time nothing is given. So these are all tools of postmodernism. These are all a critique of essentialism, a critique of this idea that there is some essence somewhere, that right? there is an essential gender, there is an essential sex, right? So it's a critique of that. Where is saying is 
nothing is in that sense essential everything gender or sex it is made a new every time and butler is seeing that as a productive thing right she is not seeing that as a problem for politics she sees this performativity and the fact that this foundation itself is contingent she sees this as productive for politics rather than something which is hindering politics right so i'll i'll just give you an example so in my research on single studies for instance i say that we we don't really know so if we have a politics on singles on people who are single how do we define who a, who a single person is and in this case butler's theory is useful because you can sometimes when you need it you can say okay a single person every time who the single person is like every time who the woman is that definition will keep changing for every kind of politics you want right for every political action every political strategy that that subject will always be changing right it cannot be fixed by saying this is what a single person is or the who a single person is or this is who a woman is or this is who a dalit is right so that is constantly that those definitions are constantly changing and she's seeing that as productive and i also i find that interesting because let's say for a for a politics of singlehood we can say let's say for a moment we take singlehood as an unmarried person at some point you might take somebody who's widowed at some point you might take somebody who's divorced so there might be different ways in which you want to look at this politics by understanding that the subject itself is always changing and that is something which is productive and this is coming from the idea of performativity coming from this um, idea of sex being itself being discursive all right okay now now we go to the main uh, main section of the of the talk right okay so uh, when we speak about when i speak about sexual politics many of you might not have um, come across or read some of these texts or thought about sexual politics in this way but this is how i want to think of it and i want to also show you this trajectory of you know how certain ideas about the way we think about sex and the relation between the sexes and that how those emerged how those debates happen in the states that emerged how those ideas then traveled into india how that was taken up and thought again to rethink sexual politics and then how that was taken forward to a completely different domain right so i'll trace this kind of very very um, interesting trajectory so we start from the sex wars in the us right so in 1982 bernard college in the united states so bernard college is on the east coast right new york they had a conference right so they had a conference which was basically pro pornography and which was talking about sexuality and sexual pleasure right and that created a major controversy so there was this whole divide between the feminists right so that's why they called it the sex wars right so one is you had these women uh, wap women against pornography and you had the women who are pro pro pleasure you know the what we call today the sex positive feminists right so was the, there was that whole debate so the women against pornography that group picketed this conference which happened in the united states right and the book that emerged and that was a major turning point in the way sexual politics was imagined in the way sexuality was thought about that was a major turning point right and the book the edited book that emerged out of that conference so carol vance who's an anthropologist in the states i think she's retired now she uh, edited this volume called pleasure and danger the um, the reference is there in the reference section so she edited this book uh, pleasure and uh, danger where she lays out this you know what is their what is their position on uh, sexual pleasure and you know how it is different from what has happened and why are they saying that right and right now when i speak about the um, Uh, what she says is i'm talk i'm speaking from the introduction to the book pleasure and danger right so that's a fascinating book if you can access it um, definitely have a look right so in this introduction she talks about sexual pleasure and sexual danger right 
So she's saying is that most of the time when we think about sexuality, we only think about it in the context of sexual danger, right? Right, sexual danger, violence, violence, right? And what she's saying is, if we only speak about it in terms of sexual danger and violence, you are not speaking to certain experiences of pleasure. If you are speaking only about sexual pleasure, you're, you're losing out on experiences. There are definitely experiences of violence. So what, what bands and, you know, that whole um, group of feminists, what they are arguing for is that we cannot have one at the expense of the other. There has to be a juxtaposition of discussion of sexual pleasure and sexual danger. And the, that this shift, why juxtaposition is because earlier the question of sexual pleasure was not there at all. You are only talking in terms of sexuality, like the women against pornography. Sex was always seen, I will discuss that in a bit, was always seen as danger, as violence, right? So now they're bringing this in and they're not saying, they're not throwing away the baby with the bathwater. So at no point are they undermining the fact that sexual danger doesn't does doesn't exist at no point are they saying that sexual violence doesn't exist right so at no point they're saying that but what they're saying is we need to bring this other perspective if you're losing out on the other's perspective you're losing out on a lot and what is that okay right so what she's saying is initially we had okay we had initially this idea that if a woman is um, if a woman is good, if a woman is asexual, if a woman is you know within the marital family, you know she will deserve the protection, right? She's a good woman, right? So that was in the, the 19th century idea. Then we come to the second wave of feminism, which spoke about increased sexual freedom, right? But despite this increased sexual freedom as in you have more access to contraception abortions and so on and so forth you have more incre you have increased sexual freedom but she's saying is the presence of danger was still there that the idea of danger and violence and sexual danger and sexual violence was not dislodged right and she's saying is what happens is women most often have this understanding have this thing that this fear, right? This this constant fear of sexual danger, constant fear of sexual violence, and this constant repression of uh, sexual pleasure, right? So this becomes an easy way for the right wing to play into this fear of sexual danger and sexual violence to say, oh, now why don't you stay back in the home, right? So what she's saying is instead of that, why don't we come from the position of pleasure? Now I'll discuss how and where in a bit, right? And she's saying is when we talk about sexual um, pleasure and sexual danger, also we have a hierarchy of sexual respectability, right? That, you know, at the top you have, you know, married, uh, sexual, the sexual hierarchy, you at the top you have these married uh, heterosexual couples. And, uh, and she's talking about the Western United States context, right? So I'm just repeating that in the Indian context, it'll be interesting for you to think about it, how how you would construct a hierarchy of sexual respectability in the Indian context so that you can think about um, later. Yeah. So what she's saying is, yeah, you have, and this is what also Gail Rubin talks about, I think in her article called, uh, the time has come, let's talk about sex, right? So Gail Rubin, thinking sex. So Gail Rubin has this article called thinking sex, where she also gives this, she makes this pyramid of, um, hierarchy of sexual respectability so at the top you have heterosexual married couples then slowly you have this so-called respectable unmarried but heterosexual couples and then you might have you know lesbians and all and then you have at the bottom you'll have uh, transgender sex at the bottom you'll have uh, bdsm king and uh, masturbation is free floating that's almost like outside the pyramid outside this this schema of sexual respectability right it's absolutely fascinating to think about how with age and time and place this hierarchy of sexual respectability changes right sex workers okay at the bottom also you have sex work bdsm transgender sex all of that you have at the uh, bottom of the hierarchy of sexual respectability right 
so so if you are on the top if you are uh, if you are a married heterosexual woman you 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 are granted a certain kind of protection right so the lower you go in the hierarchy of sexual respectability the more is it what the cost you see it as dangerous you become the gatekeeper then you completely suppress and control it right and just saying that itself is violent also that also is violent not just sexual violence is violence this is also violence right that control and suppression of female sexuality is also violence right so what they're saying is we have so many myths around you know sexual pleasure female sexual pleasure right so we should talk about this right because unless we write and talk about it this myths will keep abounding right we'll keep it big is shrouded we'll have these ideas right so we need that writing about it we need discussions about it we need scholarship on it so this is where and 1982 right this they are writing about this in 1982 and i think 38 years later 38 right yeah, 38 years later we still have an in the indian context probably spoken enough about female sexual pleasure in the let's say the in we we might have literary texts on it we are beginning to have cinematic representations of it but within scholarship also we still need to do a lot of work on it right so what they're saying is unless you talk about it there will always be some myth there will always be some misconception and idea so one is you need to you have to you have to produce knowledge around it right and the other idea that very often uh, people say is that why do you want to talk about sexual pleasure there are so many women who are who experience violence there are so many women who are in danger let us wait for all women to be free of danger and violence to talk about sexual pleasure and what vance is saying is that if we wait for that time when no woman is in danger to talk about sexual pleasure we will wait forever that time will never arrive so saying is the time is now it's not that we wait that everybody is free and that's when we speak about sexual pleasure if we do that that time will never arrive we will wait forever right and we can't think of this idea of you know sex is always this idea that it is guilty until proven innocent right it always starts as being guilty so how do we undo that right how do we and why is it important to talk about sexual pleasure and why as i say that there is a control and suppression of female sexuality right why is it violent what does it do if you're not talking about it right and why is it important to not wait forever so the saying is what if by not speaking about pleasure and joy right what we are doing is and we here i'm talking about female pleasure when we're not speaking about female pleasure and joy what we are doing is we are cutting women off from their source of strength and energy so you are cutting off so by suppressing by control and suppression of female sexuality right by thinking of it as dangerous right by all of this by not speaking about pleasure and joy you are cutting off this essential so they are seeing pleasure and joy as the as the source of strength and energy so if you don't do that at all how do you then get we derive strength and energy and from that so if you cut that off so we have to speak so you know this look at it in that way rather than seeing is oh you know it's not yet time right so so that shift happens to demand sexual pleasure as a right and right? instead of just saying oh there is violence and all let us think of sexual pleasure pleasure as a right that's what they're saying vans and vans uh, saying right so saying is we need to look so feminism needs to think of women now not just as victims but as sexual agents as sexual actors as sexual subjects right so this idea of generally when we talk about consent so if you want to you can have a look at this film called um, unlimited girls right so it's a documentary film by parumita bora right and there's a very interesting bit where she's having a net chat with people and people are talking about consent and you know no means no and she's saying is what if someone wants to say yes right so this is that what if someone wants to say yes so she's saying we need to stop looking at it only she's not saying is that danger and violence doesn't happen and that women should not say no when they want no but what she's saying is that what we are not looking at is what if you want to say yes what if you 
that we need to think of women also as agents, as sexual agents, as sexual actors, as sexual subjects. And we're beginning to see some of it, let's say, in cinematic representations, in literary representations, right? So two very popular uh, kind of ways in which we see the expression of female sexual desire and sexual pleasure is lipstick under my burqa, or uh, there is that um, film Lust Stories, that series where um, there you see that and we read the wedding. So there are a number of, so I'm not saying that those are great films or great TV series or great web series or whatever. But what I'm saying is there's a beginning, there's a beginning discussion of looking at women as also sexual agents and subjects and speaking about female sexual desire, right? So what you're saying is when we look at anything, any research or anything, instead of starting when, you know, there are discussions on gender and feminism, instead of starting from violence, what if we start from pleasure and joy? What if pleasure is a guide to action so for instance when uh, in my research on again sexuality education one of the ways most of the ways in which the government and schools and parents everybody why are they so concerned there is a lot of discussion about sex education there is a great concern why because abuse is happening because child sexual abuse is happening because because of violence so the entry point of sex cannot be violence, right? So what I'm saying is that if you're talking about sexuality education, it's because sex, that sexuality education is a right. The discussion of romance and desire and pleasure is a right. You're not talking, you're not coming towards anything from the perspective of only violence because that will not lead you anywhere. Saying what if we start where the beginning, the starting point and the guide to action the questions that you ask also in your research, instead of saying taking the perspective of violence, what if you take the perspective of pleasure? What if you ask those questions, right? And we need to look at pleasure as a valid side of struggle, not just violence also. Pleasure is also a complicated side of struggle, right? Uh, so Dr. instead Kriti, of saying sorry to interrupt you, uh, there is a huge yeah. humming <laughs> sound like that of a yeah yeah. Now 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 the sound is gone. Now the sound is gone. Yeah, now it's okay. Sorry to interrupt. Please carry on. No. Okay. Should I repeat something or is it fine? Is it you? You please start from where you have stopped. All right. Thank you. So, uh, so what what uh, they are saying is that instead of saying that, instead of having this negative idea that we don't want, you see, they're not saying that we should not have violence. What they're saying is instead of just demanding this negative thing of a negative refusal of violence, let's have a positive demand. Let's have a positive move towards pleasure, agency, and self-definition. So you understand the, the way, the demands that you make determine your quality. The demands of sexual quality that you make determine what you'll get. So if you just ask this negative demand, we want less of violence, that'll not lead you too far. But if you say rather, we want pleasure and agency and self-definition. It is understood that there will not be violence and you will get much more, right? So there is that shift that they make within sexual politics from violence to pleasure and combine it. They're saying we have a juxtaposition of pleasure and violence and we're coming from that perspective and we look at sexual pleasure as a right. Okay, now this idea, this happened in 82, and this idea travels to India through Vance's text and uh, Carol Vance has been coming to India for a number of workshops over the last decade or so and I've attended one of the workshops. So that the, those ideas, what happens is those ideas percolate, right? Those ideas about thinking about sex and sexual politics, those ideas percolate, right? And one of the ways in which it's percolated and come down to is in uh, uh, Dr. Shilpa Fatke's work, right? So we will specifically look at how this sexual politics is now rethought in the Indian context through her text called If Women Could Risk Pleasure. Again, the reference is there in the reference section. Okay. Now she's saying is here it's talking about women's access to public, uh, public space, right? And it's, it's working with that same idea of sexual politics of pleasure and danger, right? And we have this idea that you have the private and the public, which is basically that the private is safe and rational for women, 
that is the home and the public is violent and risky so we have this binary where the private is safe and rational and the public is violent and risky whereas and that's the idea that most people have that's what the media says that's what your family say that's what your community say right and what she's saying is when you look at research we see that far more violence happens in the private that the private the home the home is never safe for women but still you have this distinction where is saying the private is safe and the public is risky whereas actually the private is either equally or more unsafe right for women right now here she is also rethinking this idea of violence itself right we we, we looked at sexual violence and sexual pleasure right so now she's extending now we're rethinking the ideas of what violence is of what risk is of what pleasure is right and she's saying is that the, there is a violence of normal times as if there are everyday acts of violence little little everyday acts of violence those are also violence second is we have uh, the fact that we are always scared that there is a possibility of violence very often women walk on the roads i don't know if you can see me with keys like that in their hands right or their fist held tightly to to you know you always looking over your shoulder so that perception and possibility of violence itself is violence that perception and possibility of violence the fact that you're constantly alert in that fight and flight mode you're constantly looking over your shoulder right that manufacturing that mode itself is violence right so the perception and possibility of violence is also violence and third most important which also carol vance talks about but here it is described in our context and in a different way is that protectionism that discourse of protectionism that inside the house you're protected we need safety will give you safety she's saying that discourse of protectionism is also violence it's conditional so if you are a good woman if you are a particular kind of woman you will be protected if you are not then you will not be so a that protectionism is conditional and b that protectionism itself is violent right that protectionism itself is violent so uh we will we'll, I'll, i'll discuss that uh, you'll i think you'll understand how what i mean by protectionism itself is violent as we continue speaking right so there is a shift in discourse of how we think about violence and risk right and here she's talking about not just violence but violence and risk because here we saw right that you have the rational and the risk right so the again you see those ideas which vans had about violence and pleasure right those are being now those are coming to the indian context right and what she's saying is we have a continuum of violence it's not that actual violence doesn't happen and at no point she um, says that violence doesn't happen or that threat and the danger is not there but she says we have a continuum of violence violence where you have at one end the possibility of violence and on the other hand the violence actual violence itself so there are all kinds of violence there's a continuum of violence and it's not like if there is one thing it will necessarily lead to that but there is a continuum and what happens is that when there is increased visibility of this violence right there is increased reporting not increased reporting but you know those certain kinds of media reports right oh my god this girl was raped this girl was gang raped this girl was attacked this happened this woman that that so that frenzy that sensational that titillating those kind of media frenzy that kind of visibility will make so you know will make spaces public spaces increasingly will shrink right so the moment there is more families will say there'll be more surveillance don't go out at night don't go here don't go there there don't wear these clothes right so increased visibility of violence will lead to increased surveillance will lead to increased violence which basically means that the violence of protectionism which means that you stay at home so what you're saying is that families and communities and society is asking women to not go out to stay at home that protectionism itself is violence to to stop women from accessing public spaces to stop women from accessing anything let's say here she's talking about public spaces but 
of enjoying of that pleasure so that to stop somebody from accessing a pleasure or a joy that itself is violence right so we are looking at that protectionism as violence right and what she is saying is instead of saying that we are always at risk women are always at risk at risk of sexual violence at risk of uh, all of that instead of saying that what if what if we demand for the right to take risk what if we embrace pleasure and risk be it sexual pleasure and risk be it uh, whatever be it to be here she's talking about in the context of uh, access to public spaces right so what if we embrace pleasure and risk right what if we demand the right to risk right how does that help us rethink violence so instead of saying we are always at risk we are saying is let us demand the right to risk that we will take the risk right that they also do the risk and this is seen in a way that she's saying is in in the bombay in the bombay language you have a woman who is very daring she's like usko bahut daring hai she's a very so there is a sense of pride there is a sense of joy in taking a certain calculated risk of your own choice right of your own choice it's not that it's imposed on you right so she's saying there is a pleasure in that so what if we think of that as something that we ask as a right right so and this all includes so you see how this is tying up to this idea of we ask for sexual pleasure we come from there here similarly we ask for pleasure and risk right so that that discourse shifts right so instead of having the discourse of safety protectionism danger what actually happens when women go out and access public spaces is you have this idea of sexual safety and morality rather than physical safety right you are you are thinking that oh she might you know meet the wrong men she might uh, have relationships with the wrong men and so on and so forth right so very often the way we think about women safe the way we think about safety is often encoded in sexual safety and sexual morality and sexual virtue rather than actual physical safety right so she's saying is let's have the question right for pleasure rather than just a demand for decrease violence the same thing what carol van said instead of just saying let's have less violence this sexual politics says let's have let's demand pleasure let's demand and have a quest and right for pleasure right to risk right to pleasure right and basically the idea of equality of equality of risk right that everyone should be allowed to take risks of their choice right men take risks women also should be have the choice of you you have the choice of taking the kind of risk that you want calculated risk that you want and she's saying is that when women take a risk and if something happens it's not that you get a citizen's right to redress right so if a man goes out on the street and tomorrow he's beaten uh nobody is going to ask him why were you there with whom were you there what were you wearing do your parents know where you were they will not be asked he will be given redress he can go to a police station file a complaint somebody mugged me somebody stole my wallet there will be there will not be any moralizing around it right so what she is what she what chilpa patke is saying is that women should also be allowed to take their risk and if something happens they should have that same citizen's right to redress it right where you have a where you have a proper due process and not be questioned as to why were you there what were you doing there what were you wearing with whom were you there and the idea of do your parents know will call your parents right so whether the family and the parents become a greater site of violence and anxiety and fear rather than the the violence itself right so so what they're saying is what she's saying is that now we're shifting this whole sexual politics by shifting to the question of right and citizenship right so instead of instead of saying that we want less of violence we're saying we are claiming citizenship we want the same rights we want the same agency right so you're claiming citizenship in relation to public spaces right so how we can think of these ideas of sexual politics and how we can use those ideas to think about different things in the indian context right so this is how those ideas have moved right okay we have time right so i thought ah, we have yes time. yes yes we have okay so ah, let me show you now two short videos
सॉरी इन माई बैग एक डर सा लगा रहता है कि जल्दी घर पे आ जाए वापस लिमिट लाइक वी हैव टू बी बैक अराउंड नाइन और लाइक टेन थर्टी Normally I take my car wherever I go, so that's it. They always tell us to come with some people. Alone? No, never. In the night I go with friends. I make sure there's somebody of the other way. So, but always, always parents allowed. करते नहीं रात में तो सब parents बोलते हैं घर पे जल्दी आ जाओ. लेकिन हाँ यहाँ पे है तो Bombay है तो it's like कि हाँ 10 बजे 12, 10 11 last. उसके बाद 12 बजे तक तो शायद I can't. One is that each time there's an act of violence, like the Delhi gang rape, what one hears from young women is an anxiety not about public space, but the anxiety that their movements will be further restricted. You know this this idea that oh this is being written about and now I have to come home at six o'clock because my parents think it's unsafe. And certainly it's no more or less unsafe than it was before that incident happened. But because there's this air of violence in the public, it's like everybody needs to come in in order to be safe. So this kind of myth of the public space. A that you are in public and therefore you will get raped, or B you are in public wearing a particular kind of clothing, are all decimated by facts. In fact, even though rapes in public space are much more publicized than those that happen indoors and in the in the home. they are far fewer actually statistically when young women are caught by police for instance either because they are out late at night quite often because they are with men either their boyfriends or just men friends and the comment that the police often make and this has been reported to us while we were interviewing people is that shall we tell your parents and the young women are sought to be shamed that do your parents know what you are up to what would your parents think if and one of the things that occurs to us is that how much would the terms of that negotiation be transformed if these young women could say yes my parents know where they are and let me call them and so i cannot urge parents enough to convince their daughters that whatever they do the parent is behind them and the parent is certainly a less frightening person than this policeman because quite often for young women the parents are far more scary and one of the other things we found in our research is that young women will take risks with physical safety in order to safeguard their reputations because if men friends or boyfriends were dropping them home in the night they would get dropped off 100 meters from their house rather than at the house so that no one would see them being dropped off by a boy at the very pragmatic level is to manufacture safety first so to let people know where you are to let perhaps a parent or a friend know when you're leaving and so if i know where you are then i am both reassured that you're well but you are also manufacturing safety for yourself but should violence occur two things one as i said earlier to drill it into them as flavia has been saying that it's not a fate worse than death and it's possible to deal with it and move on safest places and the safest cities are those which are peopled by different kinds of people you know that if there are multiple kinds of people across class men and women trans people as well occupying public space when there are street lights when there are shops open and restaurants open these are the spaces in the cities that are the safest those that are occupied by people hawkers provide lighting people hang out near hawkers hawkers provide eyes on the street hawkers make streets safer we're trying to argue that women have the right to have a relationship with their city to walk on the streets when they want to take risks that they choose so if i want to be out at 2 am i understand that that comes with some risks it should not come with the risk of lack of lighting and it should not come with the risk of lack of transport and i think that if women do choose fun over safety then nobody should question our right to do so many many uh, sort of activist marches take back the night marches and now there are sort of steady groups that run in calcutta and there's just one start one started in delhi now these just periodic sort of claims to the street also continuously remind people that in fact women are full citizens and with full rights to public space in the constitution okay so i'll show you one another clip which is a comedy sketch but uh, which will relate to the discussion we were having about um a uh, kind of sexual violence and physical violence here's your tea are you feeling a bit better not really no 
Okay, well, can you describe the man who mugged you? Um, he was about five foot ten, short, dark hair. He put a knife to my throat and he demanded my phone and my watch. And were you wearing what you're wearing now? Sorry? Is this what you were wearing when it happened? Um, yes, but... You look quite provocatively wealthy. <laughs> look, I, I fail to see how what I wear has any well, bit... just a bit of an invitation, isn't it? Like you're advertising it. <laughs> you seem distressed. I'm going to bring one of our councillors in. This gentleman's a bit upset. He was mugged earlier. Oh, dear. <laughs> had you been drinking? Yes, because if you've had a drink, it can send out confusing signals. Lead somebody on with a nice suit and the phone, and then at the last minute say, I don't want to be mugged. He put a knife to my throat, and he demanded my possessions. I mean, and you just gave them to him. Did you even scream? Uh, okay, um, I, uh, Shaikat, sh can I uh, show the video on YouTube? Because, uh, are you there? Yeah, I'm there. Okay, can I just show the remaining of the video on YouTube? Is that okay? Yes, okay. Yeah. All right. All right, now we go to the... <laughs> We've got to find this guy. The people of Britain might not know. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So now we go on to this, to the way now this idea of sexual politics changes with when you look at the scholarship of Lata Mani. Uh, many of you might have come across her work, contentious traditions, her later work as well. Right? And she says that let's look at sex as a spectrum. Okay, let's look at the spectrum of sex, right? So she's saying was on one end, uh, we have this, this response, but there's the kind of right wing response, like love regulating sex, seeing sex as dangerous, as shameful, as something that you need to discipline, moral position on it, right? And on the other hand, we have this position of liberatory position, right? Liberate sex, and this is the response to wasteful regulation. And this is that you know you have sexual self determination. You are a modern individual subject. Uh, questions of freedom, and this is often the feminist and queer perspective, and the left perspective. So here we have the right perspective, which is you know this whole regulation, and then we have the you know left and feminist and queer perspective, which is talking about it, which is in response to regulation. So one you have regulate, and one you have liberate. To saying this is the spectrum on which we often see discussion about sex education. Right? This is the this is the spectrum. And now she's saying is what do these both do? These both positions of regulate and liberate, both these positions have something in common. Both these positions see sex as irrepressible, as spontaneous, as irresistible, and as exceptional, right? It's exceptional, so let's regulate it. It's exceptional, you have so much freedom, right? So the both these positions, even though they are antagonistic to you know appear, she's saying is what they both have in common. They have both in common this understanding of sex being as the something exceptional, you know, it's oh my god, it's spontaneous, you can't repress it, it's it's irresistible, it's exceptional, right? She's saying is they have that in common. What she's saying is, sex is, earlier it was not seen as a right, like a right to food, you have right to water, sleep, education, and so on, right? And then you have, and then slowly over time you have sex, which is seen as a right, which we discussed earlier, and you know, it's something that you demand for freedom. But she's saying sex, actually, if you look at it, it is both a need and a desire, right? So it is both a question of right and freedom. Right? And sex is connected to the triad. And she, uh, Slatamani often functions with this triad, right? The triad of the body, mind, and heart. Right? And I've given the reference to her article and her book. It's a fascinating book and article. I would urge you to read it. So she's saying is that we often, 
uh, yeah, sex is connected to the triad of the body, mind, and heart, and that there is both. It is both a seen as a need and a desire, and that these both of these ideas of regulation, both extremes, they do different positions. Look at it in the same way. Imagine it in the same exceptional uh, in the mode of of it being exceptional. Right? So she's saying is what the queer. feminist and left positions what they are actually doing is they are only talking about difference and plurality right many of you might have come across the term of difference right which is like you just have more of the or different kinds you have a plural right this kind of sex that kind of thing you know but what she is saying is when you talk about difference and that's something which a uh, number of uh, feminist politics and dalit uh, scholars and number of let's say uh, scholars on race has spoken about the question of difference and many of them say that we need to move from the question of difference to standpoint for instance sharmila rege's work or even um, right so she's saying is all we have is difference but what happens when you have all this difference and plurality what you're not doing is even the lesbian standpoint for that matter right instead of just having the difference what they're saying is what lata mani is also saying that same thing that critique of difference is that you're not dismantling the core when you have this different and plural thing what you're not dismantling the queer feminist and lesbian positions are not dismantling the core what is this core saying this is the core which both the left and the right agree on which is that sex is irrepressible spontaneous irresistible and exceptional so this core of sex being a particular way is not being dismantled or you're saying it's plural or you're saying it's a different kinds right you're not dismantling it how do we do that dismantling yeah, unless you dismantle the score you're not going to in that sense liberate it right so you're still functioning with that same logic with the right functions so you're not really making a shift right so think what will happen what will be this radical shift and i find that absolutely fascinating that lata mani makes this um uh this this thing which is now this third position outside the right left she's saying yeah Let's have this now. Another third position, which is radical, which is deconstructing, dismantling this core, this idea of sex as exceptional. The thing is, what if we look at sex as ordinary? This is what is radical. What she's saying is, let us look at sex as ordinary, as everyday, as not shameful, but also not liberatory. Let's not moralize it. Let's not also valorize it. So neither of the left or right position, neither of these positions. neither of it's not shameful also it's not also valorized we are not celebrating it also we are not moralizing it also right so let's look at sex as ordinary every day right so it's outside this binary logic that we saw earlier right and she's saying this is what is radical sex as ordinary is what is radical this is a major shift major major shift in how we understand sexual politics right and she saying is if we look at sex as ordinary we are now already outside these discourses of pleasure danger shame power sex as duty sex as shame sex as power sex as illicit as in pornography and all of that illicit titillating sex as immoral sex as you know so the moment you take it out so what she saying is why ordinary because when you are still functioning within this binary you are still in response to regulation right you are you are still functioning within this logic of exceptional she saying you can move out of it only when you think about it as ordinary when you think about it as ordinary you move out of this binary logic you move out of all this logic of pleasure danger shame power duty illicit immorality all of that move out of it. you make it ordinary and everyday you don't valorize it you don't moralize it either right fascinating and it's always we always talk about non binary non binary thinking let's move out of that but this is fascinating how do we think about then sex as ordinary right so uh, that reference to lata mani's uh, text is there at the end you can look so that's part of her book on in the integ called the integral nature of things where she also talks about she has sections she has an art, she has an essay on intimacy she has other essays where she's thinking about the present about neoliberalism about 
capitalism and so on and so forth, right? And she's also her general work, apart from talking about the triad of the mind, body, and heart, she also talks about interdependence, interdependence right? Where she's saying, let's move now to the idea of interdependence. Okay. Now, why am I mentioning that? Because that leads us to the last two slides of the lecture today, which is about post-humanism, right? Now, post-humanism is basically now we look at this relationship between the human and the non-human world. That the non-human world could be anything, animals, uh, built environment, um, objects, um, animate things, inanimate things, right? So the human, so we are looking at that relationship and I'm giving a very, 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 very basic understanding of post-humanism. This is a very large field. It's like explaining to you post-modernism in two slides. So, you know, it is not at all comprehensive. I've given you references. You can uh, read more on post-humanism. It's absolutely cutting edge, absolutely fascinating, right? So, and this I've taken from Pramod Nair's um, book, Post-Humanism, again, very uh, foundational, easy to read text, right? And he says that post-humanism, two things. One is it's an ontological condition that our bodies itself are now post-human, as in our bodies itself are modified. We are not in that sense just pure human anymore. We are modified because there is chemicals. We are, I mean, surgically we're modified, we're technologically modified, we have machines, we have transplants, right? People have breast transplants, people have surgeries, when they have surgery, sometimes they have metal inserted in them, right? To have uh, chips, uh, you know, so chips inserted, so this whole cyborg technology. So that bodies, the post-human body, that the bodies itself are now modified because of technology, surgery, chemicals. We have chemicals constantly injected into our body, machines, right? transplants, transplants, organ transplant, different kinds, where the non-human things are also entering us, right? That the example of you have a surgery, you have broken an arm, you have a steel plate inserted to keep your whatever arm or leg together, right? So those are the kinds of ways in which the post-humanism is an ontological condition, right? The body itself is now modified. Right? The body itself is now interacting with this non-human bit of metal inside the body. Right? And secondly, post-humanism is how we conceptualize the human itself. Right? It's also a kind of, it's a way in which you study things, critical post-humanism. It's a way you conceptualize it. Right? So it's not that post-humans are not solely autonomous self. It's not that humans, we are, we are now not just autonomous self-willed individuals. But we are in connection, we are an assemblage of and we are co-evolving along with the environment and technology. Now we are, cannot talk about ourselves as independent and autonomous individuals, self-built individuals and more. We are evolving alongside environment, we are evolving alongside technology. We cannot now you know, pull these two apart, right? So we have to think about the human in that way, like we, we have to rethink of how we think about the human, right? So, so we can't think, so post-humanism also says we can't think, we have always thought that, you know, we humans are at the best, we are exceptional, we are separate from the others, we are the dominant species, so post-humanism says we can't think of it of that way anymore, right? We are all, that's why I mentioned interconnected and interdependent, what Lata Mani spoke about. You can look at Donna Haraway's work with the Cyborg Manifesto. She looks at dogs as companion species, right? So we cannot think of ourselves now, the post-human condition or the post-humanism or the post-human body. We cannot think ourselves as separate, as the dominant species. We are companion species. We can't think of as ourselves as exceptional, as cut off from the rest of the world because the environment is impinging on us. Machines are impinging on us. Technology is impinging on us. Us, our bodies, the way we perceive of what the human is, right? So this is where I want to end the talk with. So I've kind of given you, walked you through a number of ideas and ways and we end at this uh, post-humanism. Okay, I'll leave you with this slide maybe for a few minutes so you can note it down. So this is what I spoke about, Judith Butler's Gender Trouble. You'll find it online. 
Mary John's uh, article in Maitre Chaudhary's Feminism in India. Now Mary John's article, Feminism in India and the West Recasting a Relationship. There is also an entire um, uh, journal article which you can... Sorry. Yeah, sure. Can I continue? Okay, which you can download. Then, uh, yeah, you can also look at... Oh, sorry, I, I mentioned the wrong article by Lata Mani. If you want, I'll give you the right reference for Lata Mani. Uh, it is actually her article in uh, her book, The Integral Nature of Things. I'll, sorry, I'll send that to Shoykan. Um, so yeah, so no, we are not. Uh, so instead of this, we have, you can look at Lata Mani's book called The Integral Nature of Things. And in that, that article on sex is there. Then you can look at uh, his book on Julia Kristeva, Pranod Nair's book on post-humanism, and Shilpa Fadge's article on if women could risk pleasure, and Carol Vance's book, Pleasure and Danger, Exploring Female Sexuality. Yeah, I, I apologize for the wrong reference by Lata Mani. It is the book called uh, The Integral Nature of Things. Exactly on time, Shaikat. I'm yeah. absolutely done. Let me stop the screen. Thank you so okay. much, uh, Dr. Ketki, to be exactly on time and so for, for such a very uh, well researched and detailed presentation, uh, which is uh, the you know the, the motto of this STC to put across uh, our uh, participants. Uh, not only the facts that, that that are presented by the speakers but also to put across to them the fact that how uh, a speaker uh, prepares uh, what kind of uh, research and, and, and hard work that goes into the preparation of a presentation and what is the way and how should we prepare so this is this also gives us a very good idea uh, because we, we all are most of all are from uh, teaching field so this is also a platform where we try to learn from each other. Uh, how do we? How how can we make our presentations more, more interesting, and more well researched? And how much more effort can we give? So thank you, uh, Dr. Ketki, for such a well researched and uh, you know uh, meticulous presentation in a thank very you, lucid in in a very lucid manner. So if you if you might if you permit me, I uh, will ask a few questions as put forward by the participants. Sure, sure. Uh, the, the, the first question is, as this lecture is about biology, body and culture, uh, the participant wants to understand what are the views about LGBTQ and their biological given body? Should I, uh, should I take a few questions or should I answer each one separately? You, you answer directly, it doesn't matter. Okay, uh, sorry, can you repeat this again? One is as this lecture is about biology, body and culture, the participant wants to understand what are uh, your views about LGBTQ and their biological given body? Mm. Okay, this is a very interesting question and I did not touch upon that, of course, because of paucity of time, but fascinating. You can, I think for this, um, especially when you, I think what you mean, I don't know, maybe correct me if I'm wrong is, we are asking about especially questions of trans bodies, right? Trans as strict transgender bodies. I, I think that's where you're trying to ask. And um, there has been, you can check the work by um, Susan Stryker. She has written on trans. Uh, there's, a, there's an entire transgender studies reader. You can check up the work. You can look at the work of Judith Halberstam, who's written this book called Trans Asterix, A Quick and Quirky Guide to Trans, right? So where that discussion of the body, where there is, there is a tension between the way trans identities understand, or let's say the queer community understands the body and the way, let's say, when Butler said, Butler is also within the thing, but she's saying is, she gives importance to the pre to the you know discursive this thing. And here they are saying is that for us the body is important. We want to change our body, right? So there is that understanding of that. But she's saying so there has been that tension, of course, with the body because, uh, and also that that centering of the body, which also comes in if you want to look at affect studies. 
which also centers the body in that way. But here you are specifically looking at LGBT, right? And the biologically given body. I think you, um, if you look at the these readings by Judith Halberstam and Susan Stryker, that will, um, that will elaborate on all these debates on how, so this, this biologically given body, you might be comfortable with it or you might not, or very often it's the doctor in the case of the intersex person, it's the doctor who decides that, uh, you know, should we or the doctor or the parents who decide that what kind of body will this body become, the intersex body, right? So uh, it's, it's, it's a fascinating field actually because the whole question of the body and the biology takes a different perspective when you talk about trans and intersex. And it has a very interesting relationship to the way Butler talks about it, to the way feminists talk about it. That would be another lecture altogether, but it's fascinating. To add to this question, uh, yeah. in your opinion, what is mm -hmm. more important, body, mind, or heart with respect to LGBTQ and their sexual orientation? I would think they are all interconnected and they're all equally important and they all play different roles, right? But I think that body, mind, heart triad, I mentioned in the context of Lata Mani. And if you're talking in that context, what Lata Mani also says is that it's not that only the body is inert, but the body is also intelligent. And it's not only the mind which thinks, but the body also thinks, the mind also feels. So in that, if you look at even the LGBT context, what, what we're trying to also, what she's also trying to say is that these are all, all three are important. And not that we are only looking at the mind as important. We're also looking at the body as being important. And also body having a certain kind of intelligence, that matter and that body, which also Lata Mani says in trans, uh, LGBT, uh, some queer activists also talk about the body also being a site of now, not just struggle, but also of, of intelligence, of consciousness, right? So I think that uh, definitely the, the all three are important, not to kind of minimize any of these, uh, I think. Yeah, it's it's more like this triad. I think that the Lata Mani's understanding is fascinating, the triad. Uh, the next question does the idea of looking at sex as something ordinary mm. reduce the possibility of violence that's a fascinating question that's absolutely a fascinating question technically it should right technically it should because now you are coming outside that that binary violence also if you're looking at sexual violence feminists have understood sexual violence as power they have not understood as a question of desire and lust. They have understood sexual violence as a question of power. Now, that's exactly what she's saying is if you look at it as ordinary, you're looking at it outside power. You're looking at it outside morality. You're looking at it outside illicit. So obviously then the question of violence, it minimizes the question of violence. Absolutely fascinating. Yes. Uh, the next question, do you think culture influences performativity in terms of sexual mm -hmm. pleasure and danger? Absolutely, I think so. Absolutely, culture and um, let's say um, media discourses, literary discourses, all of these influence, let's say, the way your uh, your pleasure is performed, in the way your gender is performed. Absolutely, it's culturally encoded. Uh, next question: With intimacy being under surveillance both politically and morally. Taking sex as ordinary becomes challenging. Mm. How do we achieve this in the current scenario? Yeah, I don't know this. You should ask Lata. <laughs> no, this is absolutely fascinating. Can you, can you repeat the question? Sorry. If this, is, this is completely new. With, uh, with intimacy being under surveillance both politically and morally. Hmm. Taking sex as ordinary becomes challenging. Hmm. How do we achieve this in the current scenario? So again, what you're saying is intimacy is controlled. It is challenging. You're still functioning within that logic of it is either regulated and we need to liberate it, right? 
You understood? So you have to so that that sex as ordinary has to move outside those two things. When you're asking that sex is that intimacy is difficult, with you're already functioning within that idea of uh, I don't know how to explain this, but uh, maybe we can come back to this later. But I think that that's something which we should all think about because this could lead us to ideas which we wouldn't have thought about earlier. And because we're already functioning within those binaries. Can we go on to the next one, Shaikh? Yeah, this is the final question. And uh, the choice is yours because this is slightly personal. So you are free to uh, choose whether you want to answer or not. Uh, most of the critics or writers you have discussed are from West and Western point of view. Uh, do you agree with their views as an Indian Hindu woman? Okay. Uh, uh, okay, does the Bindi give away that I'm Hindu? Okay, fine. But uh, no, so that's what, that's one of the reasons also I've given the Western views to give you also a sense of the trajectory because unless we discuss Carol Vance, we wouldn't know what Shilpa Fatke is talking about. Unless we looked at, and also the syllabus demanded, we look at Kristeva, we look at Butler, right? So in that sense, it's it's not that it's it's not a personal choice that we made. Very often the syllabus we have to not talk about decolonizing the syllabus. Okay, that is one thing. Uh, let me read the question again. It's a little complicated. I'll, I'll read it for you once again. Most of yeah. the critics or writers discussed. Uh, you discussed are from West and their Western point of view that has been discussed. Do you agree with their views as an Indian Hindu woman? Yeah, why not? I think I think I definitely found, uh, let's say, it's obviously we don't today agree to Freud saying biology is destiny, right? Obviously, we will, I will agree to Simone de Bova saying one becomes a woman because then that is moving me out of the idea that I'm determined by my sex, by my biology. I will agree to Butler because that is useful for me to think about a single word politics. I will agree with ones because that helps me think about sexual violence and sexual pleasure in my own context. So yes, so what I'm saying is when it refers to me, def when it uh, definitely I agree with it, yeah. So there are certain points which I strategically take and that's what I'm saying, it's also building up, right? So today I can engage with that. I'm not, I'm not saying that I entirely agree or entirely disagree. I agree because certain things make sense to me. But the way I will engage with it in my writing will be building on it, right? So the way when I'm saying is, oh, yeah, I agree with Butler with the idea of contingent foundations. I'm taking it to think about politics of singlehood here, let's say for that matter, right? So in that sense, agreeing and taking it forward and then today I might agree and think about it that way. That doesn't mean then five years, 10 years down the line, I might shift my position and say, I want to engage with it in a different way. I, I agree with Latamari much more, which I do now also. But you see what I'm saying is these are trajectories that we make and uh, they have all influenced my own research, my own writing. Yeah, so that's the definitely. Dr. Kirke, uh, on behalf of team uh, Dad Voj, it was an absolute pleasure to have you today. And uh, uh, so the credit goes to the participants and the resource person. You can see in the chat box the plethora of compliments and the plethora of thank you messages that has been uh, shared. Can I which get is, those messages? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll mail it to you. Don't worry. Yeah, and, please. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, these messages clearly testify the kind of uh, presentation, the uh, kind of lecture, enriching lecture this was. So. On behalf of uh, Team Dada Voyage, I once again thank you. It was an absolute pleasure and honor to have you.